And we are back on the 16th annual Total Theater Broadway show. Very, very excited to have with us someone who knows quite a bit about Broadway. He's a two-time Tony nominee, and he has been, just the resume alone is exceptional. He was in the original Sunshine Boys with Jack Albertson and Sam Levine. He was in the female version of The Odd Couple with Sally Struthers and Rita Moreno and our friend of the neighborhood, Jenny O'Hara, and some unknown actor named Tony Shalhoub was in that as well. He was in a bunch of shows with a person we are going to ask about, Nathan Lane, including Laughter on the 23rd Floor, The Nance, 45 Seconds from Broadway, a Tony-nominated turn in a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And there's this musical, I don't know if anybody remembers it, uh, but he was in a show called The Producers that was on Broadway for a few years. I it just, it came and went, but he was in it. This fella is Louis J. Stadlin. He was in movies too, including Serpico and The Verdict and Portnoy's Complaint, of all things. He was on TV in Benson and The Sopranos and Smash. He was in uh, the Broadway musical, The People in the Picture, but I, have known this man for about 35 years now because he was in a little off-off Broadway musical called Olympus On My Mind back when it was at a place called the Actors Outlet on West 28th Street where Tada has had its home for many, many years. And it was just this very fun, very cute, lovely little musical. And I was not in it. I was helping run the box office of all things. One of my first jobs right out of school. And I just remember uh, the whole cast was incredibly talented. I mean, you had Martin Vidnovic in there and, and Faith Prince, but you also had Louis J. Stadlin, who was funny and nice, and I've never forgotten that. And we haven't forgotten him at all because Louis J. Stadlin is with us for our Tony show. And welcome, and how are you? I'm, I'm very well. But since you mentioned Portnoy's complaint, I would like to get all of the Prince movie and burn it. I am so terrible in that movie. Um, and, uh, you know, one of those blinking uh, performances as a, young, as a young man. But I was good in all the other things that you mentioned. Every single other thing on your resume or IMDb, you're great in. But the, the one that I mentioned, the, the one with Richard Benjamin, and who was, who was in that? with you guys. Well, do you have any Port Noise complaint stories? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry I brought it up. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. I wish you hadn't said it, and yet, and yet I led the interview with it. So please, let's move on. Transition from Port Noise complaint. Well, we're going to talk mostly about the theater, but since we started kind of a little bit with film, any stories about doing Serpico with Al Pacino and company? Uh, well, yes, most certainly. Uh, first of all, Sidney Lumet, uh, who I also did the verdict with is a was a great director, one of the best directors I've ever worked with. Uh, Serpico was a situation in which he gave us maybe one or two takes because he wanted the texture of the film to appear like almost like it was the evening news. Uh, what I was aware of was that Al, I had I had two scenes uh, with Pacino and uh, Tony Roberts, and Pacino's. Um, uh, intensity, even though I had 90% of the dialogue in those scenes, it was basically backing me off my chair. And then when I would turn to Tony Roberts, my body would go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what made him a star and, and, and continues to make him a, an exceptional star. He was and great. You, and a very different kind of charisma. You did work with Paul Newman in, as you said, The Verdict. Any Paul Newman-y? stories. Absolutely. I have one really good, uh, real good verdict story. Yeah. Uh, 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 Sidney Lumet directs um, movies by, well, well, he's gone now, but when he directed movies, uh, you would rehearse it like a play. And uh, we went down to the Michael Bennett Studios, I think, what, 81 or whenever that film was made. And uh, I had this great scene that just ended up as a tracking shot. I played a character named Dr. Gruber. And uh, he convinces Paul Newman to take the case because uh, uh, the people that he should sue uh, screwed up. It's, I, I have almost all the dialogue. It turned out to be a great tracking shot uh, uh, when we did it at the uh, City Hall in Boston, which was supposed to be a hospital. We're walking, I'm doing the scene, and uh, we're walking around this studio that you would rehearse a play in. And, sitting on the sidelines watching is uh, uh, 
Charlotte Rampling and James Mason and Jack Warden, you know, because we're running through it like a play, right? And uh, I'm supposed to be walking and, and, and uh, Paul Newman is following me. But I'm very, you know, respectful of Paul Newman. And uh, I'm not make eye contact with him. I don't want to get too far ahead of him. And it's driving a, a, a Sidney Lumet crazy. And he said, no, you don't understand. You're a famous doctor. He's a drunk. You, you got places to go. Don't look back at him. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Well, I was, you know, so respectful. That uh, took me a couple of times to do it. And then he took me aside. This is Sidney Lumet. And he said, this is the situation. When you leave him here, you uh, are going to get into a Jaguar and you're going to go over the Charles River and you're having an affair with a young intern. You have two hours to be with her and get back for your next big operation. And I never looked back at Paul Newman again. <laughs> that's, it, that's why Sidney Lumet was a, a fabulous direct. Is, is that also what makes the difference between a, whether it's film or theater, a really great director and someone who's a journeyman or not such a wonderful director? What is it? Is it just that they give you the right thing you need to go at that very minute? Well, a good director gives you active direction. You see, that's in a prime example of, of him creating a subtext and saying there's urgency here. You have to get going. That is active. When a director starts talking bullshit and you know making metaphorical references like uh, you're just like a, a meteorite, you know, flying through space. Well, you can't. That that doesn't help. It's hard you know? to play. Yeah. Yeah. But then there are directors who have uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses who I would classify as good directors. Um, some of them don't know the vocabulary of. Uh, how to communicate with an actor. They don't know the acting vocabulary. I find that very frustrating. However, some of them have uh, a, a wild imagination in, in which they create the world. They, they conceptualize the play in a very, very talented fashion. Jerry Robbins was that way. Jerry Robbins hired Jerry Friedman to work with the actors because he knew that uh, you know, breaking down scenes was not his strong suit. So he, he had enough humility to know that. Not every ex-choreographer has that humility, let me tell you. And people don't necessarily know that. I mean, you've been in a couple of musicals, including Olympus, on my mind. And it's, it's interesting that people might not think of you. They think of you as comedy. They'll see you as maybe Groucho, because your first uh, big Broadway show was Minnie's Boys, where you played Groucho Marx. And, and didn't you, um, did it take a while to break the thing of people just typecasting you or seeing you as like a Groucho-esque character? Or was that your entree? You were thrilled. I was wildly oversensitive about it. And oh. uh, I, I uh, uh, declined many, many opportunities to be Groucho Marx in the movies, in, the, in, in TV a couple of times. Groucho wouldn't allow anybody else to play me, uh, to play him, but me. While we we're alive, he was alive. We had a, a unique friendship. And I had to tell him, Groucho, you are the guy. You're the genius. I'm just somebody who is imitating you. And, and, and I understand you, and I'm flattered. But I've got to create my own uh, uh, essence, you know, so that people d don't think that I'm just somebody who they found under a rock who can imitate Groucho Marx. Well, I, now I have to ask about this. I mean, I had Dick Cavett on here a couple of years ago, and he had some, some Groucho stories. If you had a friendship of sorts with Groucho, please tell us a Groucho Marx story. Well, he was just great to me. Um, and he would find me uh, in every, uh, when I would do plays, uh, he would see me in every play. And he always came backstage and, you know, this is a little, it's not exactly, it's politically incorrect, but he would say, he, he'd say to me, I've played Harry the Hoofer in uh, The Time of Your Life starring uh, Henry Fonda. And, uh, and Harry the Hoofer was a, a part that was originated by Gene Kelly. It, had a, it was a dancing part. And Groucho came in and to the dressing room and he said, you know, you dance very well for a faggot. And every single time he would see me in a play, 
he would come back and he would say, you know, you act very well for a faggot. I, I, okay, let we'll me throw off Facebook for this, but I don't care. I, I, and by the way, that, you've got it. You've got, I thought Gilbert Gottfried did the best old grouch, but you're still like old groucho before he gets senile. That's the perfect attitude and the perfect... Groucho was never senile. Groucho had a series of debilitating strokes. And here's a good groucho story. Um, there was a period of time in which I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, I would avoid him when they would, when I'd be in LA, he would find me usually, you know, and, and my wife at the time said, uh, you're making a great mistake. You should feel privileged that Groucho wants to be with you. But he was so infirmed that it depressed the shit out of me, basically. Well, I went to Los Angeles to do something and uh, he invited me, he found me and he invited me to his grandson's, uh, I think, 25th birthday. This is Arthur Marx's son. And Groucho had had a stroke, and so he, was, he had learned to play the piano now with his left hand. And he entertained, as he always did, in the room that they had in this uh, beautiful uh, house. Um, and um, we're all sitting around, and he's singing, you know, peasy wheezy, peasy wheezy, peasy. Well, he wore down like an old clock. And after a while, we all went to the dining room. All I can tell you is the birthday boy was treated uh, like he was a pariah. I, the, the, such familial cruelty you have never seen in your life. It was so embarrassing. They just kept making him sound like he was, you know, a complete failure. And he was just awful. And I'm sitting there with my wife and it's like, how do we get out of here? This is horrible. And Groucho, who after he did his final peasy wheezy, hadn't said anything for about 20 five minutes and he was sitting at the front of the table and when the cruelty got to the point where it was totally unbearable groucho went huh! and ended it and that was the last thing he was he, he was stroked out <laughs> Well, there's a funny Groucho story. That, no, that's horrible. What, what, I mean, I didn't realize it was such a... But I don't think it's horrible. I think that um, the reason I told the story is that as infirmed as he was and how everybody was kind of ignoring him, he was still a person of prominence in that family to the point where he was the one that said enough is enough, even though he couldn't say it. Well, I mean, it was so powerful when you did it, then actually our, our, the, the Zoom froze for like two seconds. I, I, I literally lost the feed there for a moment. But it was like, boom, and then everything stopped. So, so that, that was super powerful. Acting, yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's one more intro before we get to more. Actually, this is a theater question, because you're talking all this stuff about Groucho Marx, but you also did a one-man show about S.J. Perlman. How much of the Marx Brothers and the scripting and the feeling of that was... Groucho, and how much of it was S.J. Perlman? I didn't quite hear oh, what you were oh, saying, no. how, but you're asking me about S.J. Perlman and the show. And, and, how, and the show, and also of how much, I mean, that we credit to Groucho for the lines, for the dialogue, for the acting. Well, I think he wrote one, one, of his, uh, one screenplay, which was Monkey Business. He didn't oh, write okay. it. Yeah. Uh, Kaufman wrote a lot of them. Murray Riskin wrote a lot of them. Uh, uh, I didn't get, uh, I was uh, hired uh, to play S.J. Perlman in this one person show, which was the loneliest experience of my life. Uh, I didn't really get him. Uh, and uh, I was thinking, you know, uh, well, he came from Rhode Island. He had a, apparently a thick Rhode Island accent. And uh, we we uh, tried the play out at the University of Indiana. And I got on the stage. I didn't really know what I was going to do, which is not like me at all. Uh, and I thought, this is just a charm show, Lewis. Just the material is funny for the most part. And uh, uh, I, I played women. Uh, I would be acting out his short stories. And I played a lot of, of his women which of course he has a very complicated relationship with. Uh, and uh, th that was the best part of my performance was uh, being, the, being the women in S.J. Perlman's life.
are you honest about your acting or hypercritical or, you know, you're obviously not rose colored glasses about your own performances because you criticize now too, uh, both on film and on theater of, of your own work. Um, when you're doing it, do you self-criticize? Do you look back and go, ugh? Or, you know, how do you look at your own work? I don't like seeing myself in movies. I've done 14 movies, but I never became accomplished at it because I never had parts big enough, really. I had two, two of those of the 14. But, uh, and I, uh, they say that a, um, a, a really good movie actor reveals his soul to the camera. My, my, my uh, the way I act, I never felt comfortable and, uh, uh, but I became an accomplished uh, stage actor. That's what I, that, that's what I really do well. You know, it's a question of, you see some of these movie stars, you can barely hear them when you're standing next to them, when you're acting with them. They know that the camera worships them and, you know, camera never worshiped me. In terms of what you said about being hypocritical, I think I put myself in the audience watching what's going on and saying, I ain't buying that, you know. Uh, that was certainly the way I felt when I was asked to do the first thing, really, which was Groucho. I thought I would be the first person to be pissed off at somebody who gives a caricatured impression of Groucho Marx. So I, I did something much better. It was a kind of incantation of him. He, I, 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 I put... Uh, clues together and I started off just as a you know angry kid at 14 and then all of a sudden I found groucho isms that uh, had to do with the scene I was doing so that it didn't come across as a cigar wagging you know I wasn't playing Otis B Driftwood I was playing Groucho Marx now I'm at the age now that I know when I haven't when a performance is not up to snuff. But if you have to do it eight times a week, you, you, I'm, you know, uh, uh, good enough to fool people, uh, uh, even when my concentration isn't at its greatest. Uh, but yeah, I'll walk off the stage and go, well, you certainly had better nights, you know, but um, well, let me, let me give me enough. To you, I want to throw it to you then. What would you say is a night in your stage career when you floated through and you floating off the stage and you were just, you never captured that moment again, but it was that two hours. It happens in every show. It's once, it's once, it's uh, if you're lucky, not in every show. I just did, I played Horace Vandegelder in uh, the National Company of Hello Dolly and Betty Buckley was Dolly and I was Vandegelder, you see. And we did it 338 times, but I remember a night in which I had a night and a half of this, in which all of a sudden the muse takes over and there's a sense of being alive in the moment that merges with the technical and the intellectual and line readings just come out differently. Uh, it's, a, it's a feeling of nirvana and it doesn't happen very often. And could you say that that night it, everybody felt it, or no. maybe you have that night and somebody else is having a, a normal night? I don't know other night. people. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in their heads. They, I trust, you know, that they're doing their jobs very well. I mean, you're in a scene. I'm in a scene with Betty at the end of the play. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized that the way I have said things in the past has been altered on this evening, even though it's succeeding at what the other performance is too, but it's free. It's, it's as if you are being inhabited by, uh, by the muse, by, you know, yeah. by the universe. Well, we are being inhabited by the muse of Louis J. Stadlin. And I have to say, I, I unfortunately have not had a chance to read your book, but you did write a memoir a couple of years ago called Acting Foolish, which is available from Bear Manor Media Books. And you can get it on Amazon.com. You can get, yeah. All the usual places. I, I did get a quick chance to skim the very beginning where you tell, uh, you say something 
good and bad about Mickey Rooney. And I love for you to elaborate on your relationship with him because you said he was the best and the worst person ever. Explain. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was watching him in the human comedy on Turner Classics, I think yesterday afternoon. He was so brilliant. And um, I really feel honored because I think that I've worked with two people who I would consider geniuses. One was Agnes DeMille and the other was Mickey. Now the idea that Mickey was also kind of a, uh, <laughs> he, he, he never matured beyond uh, 12 years of age. Do any men? Well, no, okay, but yeah. I said, do any men really? I mean, yeah. I'm barely forty. He really didn't. Uh, I'm telling you, it's it's different between you know uh, 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 being immature. Uh, Mickey was insane, is ba but he was a wonderful insane, a wonderful crazy, and uh, uh, this this is my story. First of all, I did the Sunshine Boys with him and Don O'Connor. Don O'Connor was this you know very, very by the book, learned all of his lines. You know, when you're his age, I know because I'm his age, I'm older now, um, the words, you know, uh, are more important, more stressful, more worrisome. Mickey never learned any of the lines. It was his adaptation of, of the Sunshine Boys and he was absurd in it. And yet, this is what happened, I, first of all, it was off stage where he would do these incredible imitations of everybody in Hollywood. That was so entertaining. I said to him, I think maybe the third performance, I said, Mickey, you got to learn the play sequentially. You know, we can't be like doing stuff from the second act in the first scene, you know, at any rate, it was my birthday. We were in Fort Lauderdale. This was a 16 week tour. We were in Fort Lauderdale at the Parker Playhouse. And Mickey is just taking a dump on the stage. I mean, he doesn't know where he is. He's not, doesn't know what he's saying. And we get to the second, and I'm furious at him. And we get to the second, uh, uh, last scene where he's had a heart attack. And it's a mawkish scene from the Sunshine Boys, but it's a good scene. And he's weeping. He, he I, I looked at him and I, I thought, Mickey Rooney, you're working with Mickey Rooney throw out the book on this and just embrace the insanity that is Mickey Rooney. And I have to tell you, for the rest of the time, I had a ball and I knew that Neil Simon was smart enough not to come and see it. Oh, oh my goodness, that's the ghost of Mickey Rooney uh, tweeting you and saying, <laughs> I'm It's the, uh, we're, you know, shutting down the city at eight o'clock. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, don't, I, I will ask him not to go writing tonight or tomorrow night. Uh, by the end of the week uh, or, or next week, you can write a little bit, but I would. How have you been holding up um, during the past, like, two and a half months in, I assume you have an apartment in New York or something or wherever, or you're in Jersey or somewhere. I mean, how have you been managing? How's it been going? I haven't been uh, uh, You know, I have my good days and I have my bad days. I'm sure like everybody else. I, uh, you know, so far have not gotten sick. So that's good. I speak to friends. Um, but I'm alone. And uh, I, I really haven't had any uh, live interpersonal contact with anybody since March 7th. So that's taking its toll. But there are a lot of people a lot worse off than me. So you don't even go shopping? You have it brought no, to I go to shopping. I go shopping. Oh, so you a little bit. You're out a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Do you, I mean, are you missing terribly being up on stage? Or is that kind of... Eh, no. No, no, I'm not at all. Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm 73 years old. I love everything about the theater. I love the dressing rooms. I love the people. I love the rehearsal. I love everything, the smell of it. I love that more than the actual acting in, at this stage of my life. Now, you know, maybe I'm passing things, but uh, I've got, uh, I was supposed to do Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman at a, a regional theater in Michigan. Well, of course, it's been put off. Um, I want to do that. I hope I'm not, you know, I, I don't think you could do it when you're 80. But uh, 
I want to do that. And if some, you know, if, if Nathan Lane or the directors who I've had successful relationships with say, we want you to be in this play and I read it and I, I uh, think it's worthwhile, I'll do it, I'm sure. But uh, I'm not going to be proactive at this stage of the game. I don't want to do TV. I don't, I don't want to do it. Wow, I mean, you're 73, you're not 93, but still, I think you you have this settled, you're okay, even if you never really act again? I true? can't say that, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm telling you now in a pandemic, of course, nobody's, uh, nobody's getting many auditions these days, you right? Yeah. Yeah, no, my frame of mind is that, uh, and I've always been picky, but I'm in a position in which I don't have to work unless, Thank God. yeah. Yeah, it all goes kaflui. Um And um, well, that's, the, parts that's, that's the parts get smaller too. It's interesting when you get older. You know, you like uh, before I did Van Together, uh, all these TV shows or whatever. It was like, uh, would you audition for Morris Abramowitz, uh, Grandpa Morris, who was uh, in the early stages of dementia. <laughs> well, that's not anything that interests me that much, unless it's a masterpiece and I'm part of you know, a successful cog, you know, but uh, at any rate, that's the way I feel. But who knows? Well, let's, say, let's make believe that, that that call that you just got on your, on your telephone was actually from Nathan Lane saying, Lewis, guess yeah. what? I'm doing you uh, blah, blah, blah. What is it? How did you develop? I'm that? saying do that, 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 that's what's left. But, well, I, I, I'm, you froze there, but, but the question is, how did you develop that long-standing rapport where you're kind of a team, not all the time, it's not like you were in Angels in America playing the angel, but still, you know, and a lot of things he's in, you're in. How did that come about? I, well, I, you know, I think that the reason why we have great mutual respect for one another, which is very important, and uh, we recognize that we're privileged to be acting with somebody who's as good as both of us are. Uh, I met him, we did uh, um, a John Guerre play at Williamstown called Moon Over Miami. That was in 1987, that was the first time. Uh, he was influ uh, very influential in convincing Jerry Zaks to give me the role of Nathan Detroit in the National Company of uh, Guys and Dolls. And from then on in, I, I've worked a lot with Jerry Zaks and I've worked a lot with Nathan. And, uh, you know, Nathan, uh, I, I had to audition for Laughter on the 23rd Floor. But um, after that, it's like Nathan, Nathan wants you. Well, you, you've seen his process. I mean, he's obviously the most, you aside, the most special comic actor that we have. So what? What makes him special? You watched him work. How does it develop? Is it there at the table read, or does it take a couple of weeks? Is he on, off book quickly? No, What's his he's, off book. he's the first one who's off book. It's a real pain in the ass. Oh. You see, and he always has the biggest part, and he's got it all memorized. But what's that's great because you realize early on that he's demanding so much of himself, and uh, he has the most responsibility. Um, especially so, since he's selling the seats uh, in a lot, on a lot of these occasions. Uh, so um, everybody gets up to snuff very quickly. He's just a brilliantly talented man. He has perfect comic pitch. He, he is a man who uh, uh, he's a serious person. So he's hooked into the you know, a lot of comedy comes from pain. And uh, he, he's, he's just a person who uh, is super talented. He's just a great actor. Can I ask, I mean, you're known for comedy. Do, do, are you dealing with pain or all those, those past few decades? Are you, you know, did your comedy come out of pain? It's a fair question. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, okay pain. Uh, 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 absurdity, the absurdity of, uh, of things, how people treat one another, the flaws that people, this is the way I act, you see. I find the character's flaw, biggest flaw, whether it's fatal or not. It's usually a comedy, it's usually not fatal. But a, a big flaw that's holding this person's back, back and is defining him, all right? And when I find that, 
I just hammer away at it all night. And that makes me funny because it's always a character who, you know, is a, he's a know-it-all or uh, he's miserly or uh, he's a Republican or whatever. Oh, wow. uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I've seen your, your Facebook posts and stuff. yeah, you're you're a little, you're political. There's no there's no question about that. Okay, but also, and you're getting into the business to begin with. Was it because your dad was uh, doing voiceover work and so that is being kind of glamorous, or that had nothing to do with it? Uh, were your folks with your wanting to be in this profession? Uh, I was uh, not succeeding at anything until I was about 14 years old. And my mother realized, who loved the theater, realized that uh, I had a, a, a creative bent. And uh, her twin brother, Cy Chastler, was the editor of Red Book Magazine. And uh, someone on his staff found a, a, an arts camp. Excuse me, it was called Great Gables Theater Workshop. And uh, uh, all of a sudden I realized that I was, I, I guess I was good at something because girls were more interested in me and that became very important. And basically that's the reason why I got into show business. <laughs> when you're 14, there's nothing more important or 24 or anywho, anyway, that's, that's true. That, that's, uh, um, I, and not to get too personal and you can totally, uh, you know, push this away, but I'm, you, you had mentioned that you're alone living alone at this point, you, your friends, uh, I think you mentioned before the, the interview that you're friends with um, a woman who's your, your ex or you're separated or something like that, but is there someone you would be with if there oh, was a pandemic right now or what? If, if what, I didn't get the last part of it. Is there someone that you would normally be hanging with if there weren't a pandemic for the last two months? Well, I'd be seeing my friends. I wouldn't be feeling that I was, you know, quarantined. I'd be there are not that many people that uh, I find that interesting, that I have a good circle of friends and, you know, I'd be out and about. It's just being alone and the constrictions that they put on an apartment house is like, you know, you have to go down and, and pick up the paper. They won't put it at your doorstep. You know, there we're living in a, a tragic time, actually. Hopefully we'll all get by. I'll, as, as we say, how love I? It should. But I would be remiss if before um, we leave Louis J. Stadling for, for this conversation, if I didn't ask some stuff about the elephant in the room, the producers, what it was like to, when you realized that it wasn't just good and it wasn't just a hit, but that it was some kind of weird, sui generis juggern juggernaut. Was there was a moment when you realized, oh my God, this is, you know, beyond <laughs> what anybody conceived. No, no, you're too romantic. First of all, I had done a movie with Mel Brooks. I was very happy to get the gig. I was petrified because uh, Nathan had lost his voice. So I went to a singing teacher and I was, you know, I thought Nathan missed a lot in New York and I'm taking that out on the road. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was a great challenge. And I thought that it was... Uh, clever and fun, uh, but it's not Guys and Dolls, it's not My Fair Lady. True, very tight. I mean, it's, it's a I know it's a, great, yeah. it was a sociological phenomenon. Yeah. It, it, it was a sociological phenomenon for about two years. And we, we felt that, uh, you know, for the first six months of the tour, I would say. Um, but, you know, uh, after a while, it's it's uh, it's hard work, is what it is. Well, do you have a, a particularly great or funny, wonderful memory of a specific night, or maybe people that you met within the course of doing that show, or a Mel Brooks story, or you know, a, a Mian story, a Thomas Mian story, you know, just just some great producer's anecdote. Um. I have plenty to say about Mel Brooks, but none of it's particularly complimentary. He's a genius, but he's a bully. And um, I, I felt my life was certainly uh, uh, made more interesting and affirmed working with somebody of his brilliant intellect. But, uh, you know, 
once once you've heard the jokes uh, three times, you don't need to hear it a minute and four times or five times. But was he, he ever mean to you? Oh, oh, absolutely. He's mean to everybody. Uh, he, th- no, no, let me just say this. He's when things are going well. He's a pussycat. But if he's nervous about something, he knows no bounds in terms of uh, how he treats people. I mean, the, the, the first chink in the armor was, I think, when Cloris Leachman really wanted to be in Young Frankenstein, and he just kind of sidestepped and wouldn't cast her and, you know, say she's too old or whatever. And, and we were like, come on, it's Cloris Leachman. You know, she wants to do it. Put her in Young Frankenstein. But, you know. That's uh, show business. Uh, you know, you make a choice about whether you want somebody in your film is different than somebody is in your film. Mm. And you treat that person badly because you're nervous about whether the film's going to be a success or not. You know, that, uh, but again, th- that said, uh, I made a very fine salary. I love doing the part. I did the part 740 something times, but if in a perfect world, I would still be touring as Nathan Detroit in that 1992 Jerry Zach's revival of Guys and Dolls. That, I felt so surrounded by beauty and the girls were great looking too, just like in the producers. <laughs> that, that does help. Well, well, speaking of beautiful women, someone who was married to the most famous beautiful woman of all time. And, and I'm kind of wondering, and I imagine his personality was very different from Mel Brooks, but you were in a production of Arthur Miller's The American Clock. I'm kind of wondering if you got to meet Arthur Miller, if he... I did, yes. Any, any memories, yes. any stories of Arthur Miller? Just that he was uh, so intellectually astute. I mean, I was in awe. You know, I, I, I don't know how much I contributed, you know, uh, uh, to, to being with him, you know, talking with him. He... He was a pissed off guy, you know, that's what made him great. He was, uh, he was a guy who was, uh, realized that there was a lot that was wrong and uh, he wrote plays about it. Well, let me ask you, I mean, I expect I'll see you, you know, Nathan Lane is gonna be doing more plays. We'll see you in a couple of those. I imagine he will, when this is over, do some acting at your choice. You will find the occasional masterpiece to appear in. But what do you, what do you anticipate for yourself for the next 10, 20 years? going forward? How, do you, how are you, do you see your life going? What are you going to do? What's your hobby? Oh, I write. Oh. I play dice baseball. I would like to travel, although all travel at the moment seems like it's in the rearview mirror, but uh, I'd like to fall in love again, that's for sure. Uh, I have two wonderful children and four grandchildren and two lovely ex-wives, but I would like to fall in love again. Um, I don't know, you know, we're doing this interview uh, during a period that is, uh, you know, when when am I gonna act again? When is anybody gonna act again? Well, no, I'm, haven't you been, I'm sure you've been asked to do Zoom plays and readings and benefits and things like that. I don't wanna, no, no. You see, that's the thing, a, a lot of people, I'm not ambitious at this stage of my life, all right? A lot of people just need to act. I don't need to act. Uh, I need to be interested. And uh, I don't, you know, and I'm a technological idiot. And, you know, so all of this is new to me. I'm sure I'll make an adjustment. But uh, no, I don't. Um, I'm more private than that. I think. Okay. Well, um, then we're extra honored to have had you on our special <laughs> Broadway broadcast of the, the Dave's Gone By show. I do want to remind people that we've been talking with Louis J. Stadlin. You can get his memoir, which is called Acting Foolish, available where all books are sold, including Amazon and so forth. So do check that out. And is there any, uh, anything that you think might be coming in the pipeline that we can look forward to seeing you in or on in the year ahead at all, or just just play nice baseball. You're telling me, Dave, what are you talking about? Well, Where are we gonna go? I, you know, I, I, I walked a mile and a half on Sunday, and then I had to go home and take a nap, you know? Oh my gosh. Well, then I'm, I'm super, super- I'm telling you, the, the death of the salesman 
just keeps getting postponed, postponed, postponed to the point where when they say it's safe enough for people to sit in the theater, I suppose that's when the theater will uh, return. But who knows when? Well, we'll be on the lookout, of course, to see wherever you pop up and wherever we can still see Louis J. Stadlin on a theater or on the page. I mean, you're, you're writing. I mean, where is your writing going? I'm putting up in a blog. Are you writing another book? What are you doing? No, I'm writing another book, another memoir about my experiences touring uh, uh, specifically with the Hello Dolly company, which was a very enjoyable gig. And I really loved working with uh, Betty Buckley. I was very, uh, I was honored to work with her. She's a wonderful actress. Well, wonderful actor here, Louis J. Stadling. Thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy by all means. Stay creative, stay active. And we hope to be, I hope to be seeing you in a lot more things in the years ahead. Okay, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.